Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, welcome. Thank you for coming this evening to our the first of our two um, slides of March. Right. Ides of March, get it? Okay, um, good, good. And so this week we have an esteemed guest with us. I'll tell you about in a second. And then I know one of the slides that was passing by is our lecture in two Tuesdays from now. Sorry, next Tuesday, I misspoke. Um, which is, uh, the young lady is gonna be speaking to us from I think Buffalo, New York, yes. or Buffalo, New York. So obviously we will be here, she will be in Buffalo and we'll do that virtually. So again, you could do that in person and come sit with us or you could be at home and watch that one. So I think we'll probably have another email that'll go out about that. Um, so this evening though, we are very happy to have Mimi with us and I have to introduce her just like she's not Mimi. So I'll just pretend like she's um, a, a, a lecturer like the rest of the ones we have. Mimi Greitzer, I'm going by Greitzer now, yes. Mimi Greitzer has a BA in history from the College of Charleston and an MA in museum studies from FSU. Um, during her tenure at the College of Charleston, Mimi worked at the Glass Lab, cataloging artifacts from Carthage from the, what was it, like third and sixth century? Third and fourth, second century. Okay, we don't quite have anything that old here. So, and then while at FSU, she interned at the John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art in Sarasota. Um, now she's been here with the History Center for, she's kind of been on and off in a couple of different capacities for, I guess about two years, I would say, more or less. She currently serves as a program assistant for both educational component, for our educational department and for the collections department. So just like the rest of us, she does a little bit of everything. But she is, I have found, uh, she is an experienced researcher. She's quite good at genealogy. I think she enjoys that quite a bit as well. And in 2019, she was a recipient of the Georgia Association of Museums and Galleries Student Project Award. And so we are very excited to have Mimi speak to us tonight on the Prisoner of War site here in Thomasville and on her um, lecture, Tried, Died and Survived. And of course, there'll be time at the end for some questions and answers. And other than that, Miss Mimi, take it away. Well, thank you, Anne. Uh, welcome to tonight. I uh, hope you enjoy the program. And of course, like Anne says, if you've got questions at the end, I'd love to hear them. Hopefully I'll have answers or if not, I'll make them up. Um, <laughs> so welcome. We've got our title, Tried, Died, Survived. A little bit of a Henry VIII play on words there, if you will. So as many people discovered during the pandemic, being closed for business can actually help you to get creative. In our case here at the History Center, we channeled our energy into revamping much of our exhibit space here in the Davis Gallery. This involved looking through our prior exhibits and finding holes in the uh, literature that needed to be filled. One such hole was the oft-forgotten Civil War camp. Used only for two weeks in December of 1864, the camp is said to have held roughly 5,000 Union prisoners brought from Andersonville prison by their Confederate guards. Journey out to the prisoner of war camp today, and you will find a small lot bisected by a ditch. On either side of the ditch are clumps of oak trees, pine trees, and a fence envelops the lot. In recent years, the city of Thomasville worked with the Thomasville History Center and Ephraim uh, to make a sign exhibiting the history of the camp and its significance to our area. And while the sign is almost billboard-like in proportions, it can't give the full story of the camp and the people whose lives were so drastically changed by their move here. Who were these people of the Thomasville prisoner of war camp? How did they survive? What were they like? And what can their stories tell us not only about a very important time in our history, but also about our own community here in Thomasville? I was able to find answers to these questions in our collections at the museum and through archeological records recently funded by the city. With this information, we were able to tell the story of the prison camp in our exhibits and shed some new light on the human factor that draws us to this site. First things first, what is the prisoner of war camp? I found most people in Thomasville are completely unaware or at least very unfamiliar with our local landmark. They may know where the Lackland Patterson house is. They may have walked up and down the brick streets of Broad Street. They may even have gone out to see Pebble Hill Plantation but the prisoner of war camp is off most locals and visitors radar. 
Ironically, they are aware of Jack Hadley's Black History Museum, which is located within the perimeter of the, of the prison camp. Located beyond Martin Luther King Drive on Wolf Street, the prison camp is often overlooked, except by the occasional student group. As mentioned earlier, the preserved part of the prisoner of war camp is a small lot, maybe a little over an acre in size. Growing up, I was under the assumption that all 5,000 prisoners were kept in this tiny space, grown men practically falling over each other trying to stay in this one little tiny square. Of course, that's not the case. In reality, the prison camp covered somewhere between five to six acres in the Dewey City area. After the Civil War, people moved to the area and filled in many of the ditches left by the camp, save the one currently preserved on this lot. Remarkably, however, much of the outline of the camp can still be seen in aerial maps today. Descriptions from the prisoners and later stories from people who grew up, grew up in the area helped to figure out this rough outline of the former prison camp. Using modern maps alongside this information, I was able to make an estimated schematic of the original site. Single entrance to the camp is still part of the street system, now Wolf Road, leading toward the camp. Ditches ran from this entrance through what is now an industrial park, rounded a corner to come back through Wolf Street, and formed a corner in the current preserved area. From there, the perimeter ran through the front of Jack Hadley's Black History Museum, turned a corner, and headed straight to a creek that runs from Alexander Street to Wolf, where it meets up with the entrance. Now, if that description sounds kind of like a baseball play, that's because the camp was designed to be, and I quote, shaped like a square, as Charlie Watt recalled. As for the fortifications themselves, they were never much to brag about. Union General Sherman's siege of Atlanta and later march to the sea in 1864 caused Confederate leaders to panic over the fate of Andersonville, especially of the thousands of Union prisoners being held there. By September of 1864, Andersonville was largely evacuated. Word reached Thomasville in December of that year that roughly 5,000 Union prisoners were to be sent here in a matter of days. General John Henry Winder, recently placed in charge of all Confederate prison camps, directed his engineers to build an entire earthwork camp. In this case, that meant digging V-shaped ditches <coughs> roughly 12 feet wide and deep with the excess dirt piled on the exterior to serve as a parapet for the Confederate guards. As with most building projects, Winder's directions were taken more as suggestions than demands. With little time to prepare and no labor force, the Confederates looked to local plantation owners in hopes they could borrow enough enslaved workers to quickly set up camp. Many enslavers refused to help. The Confederates then borrowed as many enslaved workers as possible and impressed or forced several others to help. Over a span of three days and then some, enslaved workers built a ditch enclosing the camp. The size of the ditch varied greatly as an entire wall of the camp was already an extant creek about four feet wide. A cannon was placed at the entrance to seal off the access to the prisoners and in place of a proper gate. Already behind with several prisoners housed in a nearby warehouse in the Sandy Bottom District, the camp was opened. For the next two weeks, over 5,000 prisoners survived in the camp. Those who were sick or wounded were sent to two makeshift hospitals in town. One at the Fletcher Institute on the left, a school located roughly where Harper Elementary School is today and the Methodist Church located on Broad Street downtown. Despite medical care run by local volunteers, about 500 prisoners died and were buried either on the campgrounds or near what is now Beulah, Methodist Church, or Beulah Hill Missionary Baptist Church or on the Methodist Church burial grounds, which are now part of the brick Broad Street itself. As could be expected, many Union prisoners saw Thomasville as an opportunity to escape and return home. Some were successful while others were not. Those who remained at the end of the two weeks were sent back to Andersonville after the threat of Sherman's invasion had passed. And you'll note, if you're looking here at Beulah Hill, uh, you can see just about there, the ground does a little bit of a roll where you can see where the old earthenworks would have been. Despite the rough conditions, Faced by prisoners, many considered Thomasville a welcome break from the horror scene at Andersonville. The Thomasville camp was fresh and untainted by the filth and disease that covered the grounds in Andersonville. The rations were better, with some soldiers getting meat for the first time since their imprisonment. 
The best part of all were the citizens of Thomasville, many of whom volunteered their time and efforts as nurses and doctors, or by bringing biscuits and coffee to the starving prisoners. Without these changes in living conditions, thousands more prisoners surely would have died had they been left at Andersonville. A few soldiers even returned after the war, eager to see the tiny town they spent two weeks in during one of the most trying times of their lives. Those survivors went to record their stories, preserving not only their own accounts of the prison, but also their recollections of Thomasville from a little experienced perspective. So who were these prisoners? Over the years, researchers have found several memoirs published about Andersonville with snippets of information regarding the Thomasville camp. Added to that are several local recollections about the camp, the people involved, and later uses of the campsite. Stories told by the former prisoners seem to fit into three categories, those who tried to escape, those who died in camp, and those who survived and were sent back to Andersonville. Further research revealed colorful lives lived by the former prisoners, many of whom bore the scars of war, both mental and physical, for the rest of their lives. Knowing the state of the encampment, it's no stretch of the imagination to see why many prisoners saw an opportunity to escape. While Confederate records of this period in Thomasville are scant, letters and memories from former prisoners compiled after the war show that the number of soldiers making their escape was fairly high. In fact, these stories show that there was little keeping the prisoners in besides illness and injury. And even in those cases, some still managed to get away. In the case of, of Private Michael Hyman of the 87th Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers, disease was all the reason to attempt to flee. During his incarceration, Hyman became ill, likely with a form of hepatitis that led to chronic pain and liver damage later in life. Like anyone in such a situation, he wanted to return home to his family. Having tried several times to escape from Andersonville, Hyman saw the opportunity to try again while in Thomasville. In mid-December, 1864, Confederate guards rounded up the remaining prisoners. As the Union prisoners began their 60 mile walk to Albany, Georgia, Hyman cut out of line and began to flee through swamps and forests in Irwin County, making his way to Isabella, Georgia. He was captured soon after and forced back to, to Andersonville. Despite the limitations caused by illness, Herman did escape again, this time successfully returning to his home in Pennsylvania, just in time for the war to end. Most escape attempts were carried out in teams as prisoners recognized the safety found in numbers. Soldiers Walter Hartzell, Frank Homet, and William Henry Clipson, all of Illinois, joined together to escape in a pact made on the trip to Thomasville. While still in a temporary camp in Blackshire, Georgia, Hartzell borrowed a map of Southwest Georgia from a fellow inmate. Armed with knowledge of the area, he grabbed his best friend, Frank Comet, and another friend, Clipson, who had served as an aide to General Grant. Hartzell recorded the group's adventures in a letter to a friend years after the war. I made my escape from Thomasville, Georgia, December 7th, 1864, by running the guards in company with Frank Comet of Company M and a man by the name of Clipson of the 21st Illinois Infantry. We were camped in the woods then with no stockade, only a line of guards around us. We thought that by a little strategy and boldness, we could pass these. We all slipped through without a shot. Our rendezvous was to be the center of a small swamp. That supplied the prisoners with water. Hamet and I got together soon after passing the guard lines and we began signaling for Clipson, but we could find nothing of him and at last had to give up. At that moment, a guard about 30 yards to our left sang out, where you going there, boys? I answered back, just a going out here's a ways. He walked up to where we had crossed his feet, looked after us a few minutes, and then to our great relief, walked back to his post. After much trouble, we succeeded in getting through all the troops and started fairly on our way. Hartzell goes on to tell about some wandering through swamps on the way to Florida. At one point, he and Hamet met an enslaved family in Thomas County who took them in for a few days. The family provided food and shelter, helped the men change into smuggled clothes, which included one rebel prison guard uniform and one sack that had been made into a shirt and pants, and prayed for their successful journey home. The two were able to reach Union forces in Jacksonville and were sent home. Their bond was so strong, in fact, that after the war, Hamet married Hartzell's sister, and the two families lived together for the rest of their lives. As for Clipson, the third member of the crew, 
He was forced to turn himself in due to injury to Confederate troops, not long after making the initial run through the guards. Clipson was among those who returned to Andersonville and was mustered out after the end of the war. He was able to return home where he became a successful house painter or what we would consider today an interior decorator. While being part of a group greatly enhanced a soldier's chances of escape, it was never guaranteed. Like Clipson, many escapees had high hopes but were limited by their failing health. The realization that one couldn't escape at the opportune moment was heartbreaking. Private Thaddeus Lewis Waters of the 2nd Michigan Cavalry, Company G, was in rough shape by the time he arrived in Thomasville. At the Battle of Chickamauga in September of 1863, Waters was thrown to the ground when his horse was shot out from under him. He was first sent to prison camps in Virginia. While in Danville prison camp, a Confederate guard attacked Waters, stabbing him in the hip with a bayonet. Miraculously, Waters healed up and was transferred to Andersonville. For over a year, he survived the poor conditions of Andersonville with little food of even less nutritional value. By the time he reached Thomasville, Waters had developed scurvy, a nutritional deficiency which shrank his muscles and likely led to other horrific symptoms like bleeding gums, rash, and fatigue. In his memoir, The Terrors of Rebel Prisons, Waters wrote about his attempt to escape with some fellow prisoners. I thought if I could only cross this ditch and make the alligator swamps on the Flint River, I would be safe from the hounds, who were my worst enemies, but I was afraid of alligators. I determined to escape that night, and in order to do so, must jump the ditch. So I measured off four feet with my hands and tried to jump that distance. I couldn't jump one foot. My muscles had been so affected by scurvy that they had lost their elasticity. I sat down and cried like a baby. It was no use to try. Waters went on to mention that three men successfully escaped that night from the same area of the camp. While he does not list their names, it wouldn't be too far out of the question to assume he was talking about Hartzau, Hommet, and Clipson. Waters spent the rest of the war imprisoned in Andersonville. Despite being so weak and injured, he was able to recuperate and led a rather adventurous life back home in Wisconsin. Not only was he a mill owner, also a teacher, a farmer, postmaster, store owner, hotel owner, writer, poet, and missionary. For those who are interested, Waters wrote a riveting program uh, or poem about the horrors he faced in Andersonville that can be read online. And without going too far off course into the very interesting life of Thaddeus Lewis Waters, I feel I have to mention that his missionary work as a Seventh-day Adventist brought him back to Georgia where he was arrested by a group of Baptists for trying to mow his grass on a Sunday. <laughs> As if his life hadn't been interesting enough. Of the prisoners who did escape, some made sure to come back to Thomasville after the war. Some came back to visit the spot that many considered a much needed reprieve from their lives at Andersonville. Others to visit the people who had helped save their lives during their escape attempts. Corporal Peterson Hudibras Cherry, of the 14th Illinois Infantry returned to Thomasville in 1890 and told his story to the Hopkins family. Cherry was among the men sent to the makeshift hospital at the Methodist Church. Men who sufficiently recovered were marched back from the church to the prison camp, but Cherry saw an opportunity. He cut out of line and hid under the old academy, uh, now located on Block N or about where T&B now stands. After dark, he escaped to the Atkinson house on the corner of Clay and Madison streets. Strangely enough, that meant he had to cross right back in front of the Methodist hospital. Conveniently, the house was empty at the time and Cherry was able to hide upstairs. Two enslaved people, one of whom was Tom Pettis, were aware of his location and would bring supplies and news to him. For entertainment, he looked over old accounting books stored in the house and did math for fun which just shows how tortured his mind must have been. <laughs> Cherry managed to stay in hiding for several weeks, long after the majority of the other prisoners returned to Andersonville. By that time, his new friends heard word of other escaping prisoners hiding out in the swamps behind Greenwood Plantation. Cherry was brought to them, and the three stayed in the swamp for several more weeks, aided by their new enslaved friends, including Sarah Bryant, who knitted socks for them. These, the enslaved butler would bring Tom Jones's newspaper to the escapees while the Jones family was asleep and return it every morning. After a while, news of the prisoners reached the sheriff of Brooks County, who planned to bring out his team and their bloodhounds to hunt Cherry and his friends down. 
the enslaved carriage driver from Greenwood Plantation hit the three men in the loft of the barn, which at the time was very close to the house, about where the sunken garden stands today. So you can imagine looking out the window of the barn and seeing all of the people in the plantation house. It's kind of scary like that. During the day, they were able to see through the cracks in the floor and watch as Tom Jones shut corn and fed his pet horse. Luckily, they managed to stay hidden until the manhunt was cut off and the posse returned to Brooks County. Later that night, a stable man led the escaping prisoners back to the river where they were able to flee to Appalachia. While Cherry and his friends were captured and sent to prison in Tallahassee for the remainder of the war, he never forgot the names of the people who helped him. According to the Hopkins family's recording of the tale, Cherry made sure to check on Tom Pettis and Sarah Bryant during his return in 1890. Of course, this was after he checked in with a fellow Indiana native to make sure the citizens of Thomasville would not be hostile to a former Union soldier. Certainly much to his surprise, he was welcomed around town. Even white citizens felt a duty to help the Thomasville prisoners. Nathan and Herman Wolf were Jewish uh, merchants who set up shop and home along Broad Street. Like many other businessmen, they joined the Freemasons in Thomasville, the lodge for whom can still be seen on Broad Street, where Jimmy Sewenbeck is, well, was located. Freemasons have a strict rule about helping fellow Masons out in times of trouble, no matter the circumstances. However, neither brother expected that rule to affect them as heavily as it did. One night in December of 1864, they received a knock at their door. An escaped prisoner from the Thomasville prison camp began to beg them to, el to help him escape as a fellow Freemason. After some deliberation, the brothers agreed to help him escape. They called on Edward Remington, another Freemason down the street, and hatched a plan that got the soldier back home up north, never to fight again. While those men had their share of luck and misfortune, there were several more prisoners who were not so lucky at all. Of the roughly 5,000 Union prisoners that arrived in Thomasville in December of 1864, about one-tenth would not return home. The majority were killed by disease, often something brought with them from the other prison camps that quickly spread among them. Others died in more violent ways, through accidents or suicide. With a high rate of injury, illness, and death, local citizens stepped in to help out when and as best as they were able to. Gruesome deaths took place in the early days of the camp, either during the trip or once inside the encampment. Many Union prisoners wrote about their fellow prisoners who lost hope on the move. Faced with yet another possibly horrendous prison camp, they chose to end their suffering by jumping out of the moving train cars onto the tracks to near certain death. Private William Lightcap recalled the story of one man who jumped out from the train near Thomasville. He was brought into the camp days later, hardly alive after being attacked by a bloodhound. Other soldiers spoke of a prisoner who tried to jump in Boston, Georgia. He died almost immediately and was buried on the spot. His body was relocated to Andersonville Cemetery after the war. Once inside the camp, there were new dangers for the prisoners. Despite rumors among General Winder's officers that the campground was nearly bare of trees, the Thomasville prison camp was spotted with several longleaf pines. In the first few days of settlement, Confederate guards passed out axes to prisoners so they could cut down the trees for firewood and shelter. Imagine 400 desperate men fighting over axes and the chance to chop down several pine trees before anyone else could. Naturally, this was a disaster. When Private John Foran visited Thomasville in 1905, he told a story about one of his fellow soldiers being killed by a fallen tree. Almost comically, his local African-American guide knew exactly who Foran was talking about and pointing to the ground exclaimed, why yes, here's his grave. Falling trees were not the only peril in camp. With no shade now and all the wood being used to fuel fires, the prisoners were exposed to the elements. These conditions exacerbated any illnesses brought to the camp. And after a few days, smallpox and typhoid broke out among the prisoners. Local citizens, fearing an outbreak of both diseases in town, were quick to respond. Hospitals were set up throughout town to care for the sick, wounded, and dying. The Fletcher Institute was cleared of students and arranged to hold the prisoners. Similar adjustments were made to the Methodist Church on Broad Street, a far smaller and less grand building than the current brick one. Local women volunteered as nurses, while doctors either returning from war or refugeeing from coastal Georgia provided their own services performing surgeries and amputations. 
Despite their efforts, roughly 500 soldiers from the prison camp are believed to have died in Thomasville. These men were buried in grave sites around the hospitals, mostly on what is now part of Broad Street and out on the prison grounds near Beulah, Cemetery, or Beulah Hill Missionary Baptist Church. After the war ended, Clara Barton undertook the job of collecting these bodies and others from around the South and returning them to their families in the North or to Andersonville Cemetery where they remain today. In the face of a losing battle, locals attempted to make dying soldiers comfortable in their last moments, such as in the case of Private Ezekiel Whitman Clark. Clark was a shoemaker from Maine who probably never should have been sent to battle. He was 47 when he was drafted into the army, just a month or so after his wife died, leaving him with five young children to support. By the time he reached Thomasville, Clark was extremely ill. In the makeshift hospitals, Dr. David Smith Brandon of Thomasville took pity on Clark and invited him to say, stay with the Brandon and Jones families as long as necessary. Clark spent the next 10 months with his new Southern friends, long after the war had ended. The women in the family wrote back and forth to his children and family in Maine, giving health updates and helping the family prepare themselves financially for the loss of their father. When Private Clark died in October of 1865, he was laid to rest in the Jones Family Cemetery at Greenwood. In the decades that followed, the Brandon, Jones, and Clark families remained in touch and even visited each other when possible. While stories like Clark's may seem one in a million, they were more likely one in a thousand. True, not every soldier received such specialized attention and not every citizen in town was comfortable bringing a dying Union soldier into their house. But there are stories of other Thomasville citizens stepping in to nurse the worst cases. And yet there were still other ways for locals to help the prisoners out at the Thomasville camp. Ways that aided in the men's survival. Women like Jane Ginlatt Hopkins sent coffee and biscuits to the camp, feeding as many soldiers they could with what they had. One soldier even recalled those biscuits and claimed they were the best he'd ever tasted. For many soldiers in the Thomasville prison camp, escape was not a viable option. Illness and exposure had worn them down and taken away any thought of freedom. For these men, just surviving their prison sentence was enough and fraught with enough difficulties on its own. Private William B. Smith, one of the youngest prisoners in the Thomasville camp, uh, having lied about his age, he had recently joined the army, aged 15 years old. Too young by our modern standards to be trusted to even drive a car, Smith had already fought in battles and watched friends die before he was captured and sent to Andersonville. Upon reaching Thomasville, he might have felt a little more hopeful by the change of scenery, but this would hardly be a vacation for the young boy, and by the end he was barely able to leave the camp. Smith writes about his misadventures, starting with the first day in camp. The guards threw out a lot of axes. I picked up one of these axes, but a big fellow jerked it out of my hands. Then the next best thing I could do was watch the trees as they fell and run in and pick up the limbs which broke off and drag them to where one of our mess was in charge of our camp outfit. While this work was going on, the other prisoners being quite thick in the enclosure, several were killed and others wounded by the falling trees. I was among the latter. The end of a large limb that had been broken off of a pine tree about 40 feet from the ground by a tree falling against it struck my right side and broke three of my ribs, the ends of which were driven inward, puncturing my right lung. Surprisingly, this grisly injury did not kill Smith, but it did knock him unconscious for the next three days. In the meantime, his messmates used whatever they could find, including one man's only pair of trousers, as a bandage and cared for their wounded friend. Only a week later was Smith able to get up, just in time for the Confederate guards to inform his mess that they would soon be headed to Albany, this time on foot. Suspicious of the Confederate guards and possibly unaware of the hospitals in town, Smith's friends decided they couldn't leave their friend to die in camp. They helped carry him much of the way from Thomasville to Albany. Smith barely survived his imprisonment, only thanks to his friend's intervention. This wasn't Smith's only trip to Thomasville, as he and the remaining prisoners from Andersonville were forced to march through the area on the way from the prison camp to the Union lines in Jacksonville, Florida, by the end of the war. By that point, Smith was covered in open wounds and rashes due to scurvy, and his ribs and lung were still delicate. He and his fellow prisoners spent a very rainy night in the woods around town before continuing on to Union lines. 
Upon reaching them, he was finally free and received medical attention for the first time since his capture eight months previously. Like many others who survived the camp, Smith was plagued by health problems for the rest of his life. <clears throat> After experiencing asthma, his lung collapsed a second time and was partially removed. His spine weakened and he experienced several bouts of paralysis from the waist down, leaving him eventually confined to a wheelchair which he had to be strapped into in order to sit upright, as you can see in his photograph. He was forced to rely on his pension, which paid enough to support his small family. In 1892, Smith was convinced to write down his stories, including his experiences in Thomasville, which became his book On Wheels and How I Came There, which can still be read online today, which I highly recommend too. In many cases, survival seemed to be an issue of mind over matter to the Union prisoners. Private William H. Lightcap of Wisconsin later wrote in his memoir, The Horrors of Southern Prisons During the War of Rebellion, that there was little choice between living or dying. While staying in Thomasville, Lightcap experienced the, the sweep of smallpox that killed so many. While he had been vaccinated several times as a child, he believed the treatment never took yet he managed to avoid falling ill even when those around him did. As he remembered, I was right among the sick and dying by day and by night and woke one morning right against one who had passed away. Lightcap claimed his saving grace was something he realized early in his imprisonment. The control of the mind has as much to do with our endurance there as our physical condition. Worrying and fretting killed hundreds. Despite caring for dozens of dying messmates, starving and suffering as well, Lightcap and many other prisoners brought to Thomasville managed to survive not only the two week reprieve, but the next few months in the war. When he was finally released, Lightcap weighed 86 pounds, down 79 pounds since his capture in July of 1864. Math there means that he would have been 165 when he was captured, so quite a, quite a loss. Over the next several years, he was able to make a recovery and live a productive life. Lightcap makes a great case for positive thinking. Having friends and staying positive in times of trouble were a great start to staying alive in the Thomasville prison camp. Community support was even better. As we heard earlier from Private Cherry, some townspeople brought food and coffee to the, su to the suffering prisoners. Private Lessel Long recounted a similar experience as the men were marching back from Andersonville. Citizens came out to see the legendary prisoners as they filed out of the camp. With pitying faces, Long believed the town was full of sympathizers. He would find this to be at least somewhat true a few months later when the troops were marching back through Thomasville on the way to Jacksonville, Florida. A buddy of Long's took the opportunity to escape into the woods and forage for food. Along the way, he met a friendly Confederate soldier who invited him home for the night. The rebel and his mother were sympathetic to the Union prisoner and sent him back with enough rations to split among his friends, including Long. This was the first food those men had had in over 24 hours. Luckily for Long and many others, the war was over by then and they would soon be shipped home. Long recovered and used the metalworking skills he picked up while imprisoned to start his business as a wagon maker. He wrote his memoirs, served his county as a city treasurer, and got into a little trouble with possibly embezzling some money. Uh, an otherwise much improved remainder of his life. In the gruesome history of Andersonville, the prison camp at Thomasville is a tiny blip on the timeline. But for the men who experienced the camp, it was much more than that. A refuge, an escape, a death sentence. Of the roughly 45,000 Union soldiers who walked through the gates of Andersonville, over 13,000 never returned home. For those near 5,000 Union prisoners brought to Thomasville, somewhere around 500 would not go home. For our lucky few who came here and survived the two weeks or were able to escape the Thomasville prison camp, their stories give great insight into the circumstances of our own small slice of Civil War history. But far greater than that, they tap into the strengths and weaknesses of human nature and serve as a warning against future war on our American soil. Preservation of this site must be continued. As for the museum, with these stories and the details contained in them, we were able to create a more rounded, humanized picture of our town's closest run in with the drama of the Civil War. A picture which we can share and distribute to the public, both here in town and across the nation. Thank you.
If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. And yes. I've heard a lot about the hospitality of the citizens of Thomasville, the uh, Confederate prisoners that were up north. Did they receive the same hospitality? Do you know? It was certainly something that the people down here were hoping that their prisoners up north did. Um, there are stories of prisoners, Confederate prisoners up north who received hospitality. The difference being that they didn't tend to move around as much as with Andersonville. The Andersonville prisoners got moved at least four different times in five different directions. And so they were frequently among citizens who would have seen them and taken pity. Right. Oh, yeah. CPR work that they did yeah, for several years, um, Amelia and I would go with the camp and watch Susie and her uh, cadaver dog. And of course, the city brought them out and had her cadaver dog sniff the area. Um, and that was fascinating because she told us about how the chemicals uh, left over from decomposition of bodies will be taken into the soil and brought up through the trees. Now, when Thomasville prison camp was deserted in December 1865, they'd only been there about two weeks. And afterwards, of course, with typhoid and smallpox being just about everywhere, they burned the camp. And our archaeological records do show a small layer of burned material. Now, they didn't find any decomposition of human remains material in that chemically, I guess, um, which is definitely possible, probably because they did have the burial site that I mentioned. And also, like I said, afterwards, uh, Clara Barton brought her folks out to come and collect as many bodies as they could. That being said, that doesn't mean there aren't possible bodies that got left behind. Um, and so when Susie brought her dog out, he or she, Shiraz, uh, would go mark the trees or sit by them, not mark them. <laughs> She knew her mark was by the trees and she would go sit by them to alert Susie that she smelled those chemicals. So whether someone was still there in the ground or not, we can't entirely say unless we go dig it up, uh, but there is a possibility. Yes, it would come out the tree sap. So even if, even if the body was gone, which in this case, that soil is so acidic, it would probably have eaten away anything left. Yes, sir. About uh, 27 years ago, Thomas University did some archaeological studies mm -hmm. of the no man's land, and they found the fire pits, the watch mm -hmm. fires, and they found artifacts uh, which were interesting. And then they did some ground penetration radar, and they didn't find any. Uh, body remains. From what we've seen of, and we've got a small exhibit in the back of what they dug up in a similar archaeological excavation, I think, a couple years ago. Um, and there's just not a lot. And of course, if you're only staying in an area for two weeks, and they didn't have much to begin with, there's not much to be left behind. But it is interesting to see what does or doesn't come up. Yeah, they, may, they mainly found Buttons, mm -hmm. pipes, uh, belt buckles, things of that nature. Nothing really significant. Yeah. And of course, this area was inhabited afterwards by tons of different communities over the years. So they left their stuff behind and you'll find bottles and things. Yeah. yeah. It's neat what they find, even if it's not exactly what you're looking for. An online question yes. um, from Terry Rollins. Yeah, where exactly was it located? I think he logged in um, like just after. Okay. Slide, so can I can go back to that slide. Could you repeat the question, please? He, uh, a gentleman who's online asked where the camp was. I believe he logged in just after me finished this slide. So, yeah. Um, the, what you can go out and visit is located on Wolf Street. And you can see it's kind of this corner over here between Wolf and McKinley Street and uh, Cook. And I think that's Cobb Street run uh, perpendicular to that. Um, as for the camp itself, it kind of covers what's most of the Dewey City uh, area now. 
And you can see I've got stars out here, uh, the big star being where the camp entrance would have been. And then the smaller star is where that kind of prison or burial ground would have been, according to what records we have. Do we also like to know where you got some of your sources and your information? How you found it? Um, several, several years ago, when they were writing the history of Thomas County, um, William Rogers, when he did his book, uh, came across a lot of these stories that involved Andersonville. And of course, you go through those and read them and find little snippets about Thomasville. And I went back and, of course, read over those stories as well and went into the books just to see what all they had to say. And that's where most of that information came from. You're so much more now that digital. Yes. Than when Bill Rogers was writing his stuff. Yeah. Yes, he had to do it the hard way. First, he went to his primary resources. Yeah. Right. Newspapers and things like that. And these, yeah, diaries people kept and things right. like that. There's this surprising amount of folks who, after all this, needed to write out what had happened to them. Someone came along and said, you've got to write this story. And that seems to be the same thing every time someone said, you've got to write this down. So thankfully, they did. Yes. Is there any estimate at all on that? Not really. This is kind of the first we've ever looked into how many escaped. And of course, that's kind of, it gets a little tricky in how you count that because the Confederates were keeping their records. They would go through and they, I know one of the soldiers was talking about they have to know the exact number of who died and who lived and everything because every day they took the roll. So they'd come out and they'd say, okay, Greitzer, stand up. And Greitzer would come out and stand up. So if you didn't come out, you were either dead, which was possible, or you were gone. So I guess we'd have to take those uh, records and see who actually survived that and who didn't, which is a lot of numbers. It sounds like, I'm just extrapolating a bit mm -hmm. here, that if, you know, they don't know that these weren't thinking about the end specifically, but it's just the incident. It sounds like things were like, I would say a little lax, but it, you know, <laughs> I mean, if you're a Confederate uh, soldier or something, you are, I mean, they had it for everybody. Mm -hmm. I would say, the letters had the worst. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to make it sound like nobody was doing their job, but. Well, and when you're marching 5,000 people back through South Georgia, it's kind of hard to keep an eye on them, too. From what it sounds like, Thomasville was definitely very lax. And even some of the guys say, we were just standing in the middle while they were building the encampment around us. So, you know, not much to keep you there other than like they said, the bloodhounds. And at that point, uh, reading the stories, you really get a sense of how many of them were suffering from scurvy or some related disease. And scurvy, of course, really affects your muscles and your ability to walk and also open sores related to that as well. So it was kind of one of those things were relaxed because a, they couldn't manage to get the supplies and labor needed to do it fast enough. And B, it's not like these people were in great shape anyway, so they didn't have to worry as much. Yes. Yes, sir. If you had to give us a single best source to clean what a lot of what you've said, I know there's several different places. Mm -hmm. Which one, maybe, uh, which was Bill Rogers or his book? His is very good, especially for um, Thomasville history. It's also kind of one of the only. <laughs> um, but as far as the guys themselves, my favorite was the one by Thaddeus Lewis Waters. Um, his life was just interesting, but his take on everything is very. We have his poem on the yes, back we have his poem wow. back there, and it is. It's dark, but it's a dark subject. So. But you probably get used all of these things used. Like you could get used books. Um, they're online in several places too. Uh, thank goodness for places like Hatha Trust, I think uh, we'll go through and Andersonville might too. Scan the pages and stuff like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Do you have any historical information about what the weather was like while they were here? Yes, um, a lot of them recorded it because it was good and bad. When they arrived, everyone seems to mention that it was sleeting that day, which just made everything worse. But of course, it's December in the South, so you're going to get crazy days like 
this weekend that we're about to experience where it would be cold one minute and then hot the next. And so they're a lot better off than they had been in Andersonville where it had just been cold all the time. Here, they didn't have to worry so much. And so nobody went ahead and built any kind of lean twos or anything like that, which was not just because they would only be there two weeks. They didn't know that, but just because they didn't need them in the South Georgia sun. So one interesting thing though, when they did return back to Andersonville, uh, the time while they were gone had been used to kind of make modifications to the camp. Uh, General or Captain Wirtz, who was in charge of the camp had gone through and made some huts for the men to sleep under. Of course, not enough for everybody, uh, but they had also tilled the ground while the men were gone, which in a way was kind of nice because it did get, you know, turned over the ground, kind of got rid of the filth and disease that had been sitting on top of it. But on the other hand, it was still winter. Uh, they arrived Christmas Eve and of course it was raining and here's some newly tilled ground. So it was absolute mud, so. Mm -hmm. Apparently quite a while. Um, it was at least three days to make the trip from Thomasville to Albany on foot. Uh, and that's for 5,000 people. So of course it went in waves. That's a lot of it is um, most people, we look at it and we go, oh, two weeks they were here. Well, it was in waves of two weeks. So some were here the full two weeks, some were here only a few days, just depended on what time they got in. So same for getting back to Andersonville. And then of course, once they got to Albany, they caught the train, went back to camp and got in that way. And how long were they back at Andersonville? Um, from December 24th until sometime around, I believe it was end of April, early May, they started getting, they weren't fully told that the war was over or any of the real details, just that they were being moved again. And of course, they'd been told things like that and rumors had gone on for the whole time they were there. So nobody was really sure what to believe anymore. But I think it was end of May or end of April, early May, they started heading out. And I think most made it home at least by June or July of that year. When did that the reason that they were in Thomasville for such a short time? The reason? Um, they had been before Thomasville. They had been from Andersonville to Savannah. This was during Sherman's March to the Sea. They were trying to figure out where to send these guys. So from Savannah, they went to Millen Camp. Uh, that didn't last long. They were sent over to Blackshire, which was a similar earthwork, temporary. Uh, and then of course, sent to Thomasville. That being a way to get them once again as far away from Sherman now that he had changed directions from Atlanta. So that was their reason for being in Thomasville in the first place. And then the two weeks being that by that point, there were rumors that uh, Sherman was sending folks down this way to come release those prisoners as well. Of course, that didn't happen, but uh, there were battles that were fought, of course, a lusty natural bridge over in Florida. And those were seen as the Union Army trying to get to Thomasville uh, to liberate those prisoners, which ended up being in a newspaper from that time period of Union sympathizers saying they're coming to liberate the prisoners in Thomasville, except they were doing that in February, so they were a little late. We were told everybody about our Andersonville. Yeah. Yes. So we, we talked about it so much this evening. Now we get to go there. Yeah. We get to we maybe not totally retrace the stuff. Yeah. Uh, but our, our own little tie-in. Um, so we are taking a member field trip to Andersonville this Saturday. Um, with your registration, we are going to provide a box lunch to be determined, as in I'm planning that tomorrow. Uh, everyone is responsible for their own transportation. We're going to meet at 10 a.m. at Andersonville National Historic Site at the Prisoner of War Museum. We'll get an introduction from, from the staff there. Take a look around, um, be able to uh, do a little independent looking, have lunch together, and then at 1 o'clock, we will get a guided tour of the prison camp site itself from one of the rangers, and then you can do a little more independent exploration at the cemetery or just generally across the grounds there. Um, so if you're interested in joining us, whether you are a member or not, although we would love for you to become a member, uh, please feel free to chat with myself or Anne or Mimi before you head out this evening and we can get that taken care of for you. So we will go on Saturday. Oh, and they've got chairs. Oh. 
motorized scooters for anyone who they have wheelchairs and they do have scooters. for transportation. Yes, I have sir. A question. Uh -huh. um, the commander or the commandant of Andersonville was tried and all. Mm -hmm. How about the commander of the Thomasville prison camp? Um, generally kind of went under words, the commandant of Andersonville. So he was the figurehead of all these other mini camps. Uh, as far as the people who were in charge of building Thomasville uh, prison camp, they were minor under him. So different colonels and captains and things like that. Uh, they did not get tried for this. Uh, and for the most part, weren't really in charge over here other than building the place. Thomasville was kind of hands off as far as that went. I never heard of that. Yeah. Yes. Do we have any information on high ranked people that might have been there, or was this generally for lower ranked people that were captured? Um, most of the stories that I've seen are from privates, but there were higher ranked. So we had that adjutant who uh, worked under Grant. Um, for the most part, a lot of officers earlier in the war had been traded back out. Uh, and as far as later in the war, you know, you've got privates who go in, they're not as generally useful in war, unfortunately. So they didn't get traded out so much. So they were stuck there for longer. There were sergeants and they were usually put in charge of their mess group. So I know one, a couple folks actually had stories about any time rations were given out, sergeant was put in charge of cutting up the rations for the mess and then distributing they said they got a cow's head once and so someone got a horn and someone got a little piece of flesh and someone got a bone and went on and on. So. And yeah, that meat covering, I think he said 90, one cow's head for 90 people. I'd hate to have to be the one trying to divvy that up. He said it took hours to figure out. So. Mm -hmm. It wasn't every human being in Andersonville was right. evacuated. So when they got to Savannah, it seems that everybody split into two. So you were either sent up to South Carolina, usually Charleston in that area, or you were sent down to what would eventually get to Thomasville. Um, and then of course you've got people left behind each way too, who are too sick to move or nearly dead anyway. Um, how they picked that number, I uh, can't exactly say other than they knew how much room they had at each place. Um, by that point, I think they had maybe 30,000 prisoners to divvy up at Andersonville. So they were trying to empty Andersonville. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So maybe at least a thousand sick folks still at Andersonville. You get to uh, Savannah and you've got 29,000 divide that 5,000 come down here with more being sick along the way. Maybe another 22,000 went to Charleston, something like that. That's a lot of math. But yes. Yes. I guess it's kind of a silly question, but why didn't they just abandon them? Um, they talk about that towards the end of the war, especially in that they didn't want to give them hey, the war's over, you can go home, because they were kind of afraid what that would mean, um, especially because you are releasing them into basically the wilderness, uh, also with folks along the way. So either someone's going to come out, see Union soldiers walking around and not be friendly, or B, they're going to be friendly, and then you've got all these possible Union soldiers being sent back to the front lines to fight. Um, mainly just the issue of will they be able to get home and go back to fighting again was their main fear. So even though most of them were in no shape to be fighting, there were some like Michael Hyman, who uh, I talked about earlier, he was pretty determined that he'd get out and go back to fighting. And reading his story, you just got to sit there and think you're in no shape to do any of that. You're nearly 47 years old, you've got blisters all over your feet and who knows what else you need to go home. But some folks were determined in that way. I know as far as um, when they were still in the camp, especially at Andersonville, 
the guards would go around and say, you know, there are options for you. You don't have to stay here in the prison. And one of those was to be galvanized. You would sign something that said, I'll be a Confederate soldier from now on. And of course, there were some who, uh, who did that. And they talk to their buddies about it and say, well, you know, I'm going to sign the paper, say that I'm going to be sympathetic to the Confederacy. But once they put me out there to fight on the front lines, I'm going to run across the line and rejoin my Union troops. And of course, a lot of them said, you know, they had this idea in their head, they'd go out there. And of course, the Confederates knew exactly what they were going to do was try to escape and go to the other side. So they would stick them in the back to care for the fallen Confederate soldiers which meant that they could never be out of the sight line of their new Confederate uh, leaders. So there was kind of the idea that they might run away and rejoin. Uh, and that was definitely a fear to them. All right, well, thank you all. Thank you very much for coming out. Yeah. Thank you all very much. We have our, our lecture next week, Amelia, right? Yes, so it's going to be an extension of the uh, topic that we had this evening. It will be um, to focus on disability in the Civil War. Um, and her book, uh, Bodies in Blue, is available for purchase through the bookshelf. Um, if you want to give them a call or go online and order it. Um, she will join us remotely, but we will have her up on the big screen so she'll be able to hear and answer any questions that we've got. Um, so you're welcome to join us here. You're also welcome to join us from home uh, by Zoom webinar, and we'll pass along your questions as we did tonight with the folks that were at home. Um, so if you want information on how to sign up for that, we'll have to get you that as well. So See you next week. Next week. Mm -hmm. Or Saturday. Or Saturday if you want to go answer them. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.